قبل ما نعمل الاندرس تاعي نشتاق لي على على دوك الاتس اكو الاطفال تاع الدريت تاعي في التلفزيون كنا نعمل راجل غني الفين حنتكلم مو بالانجليز ريت نسبيغا لي المين سبيكر هو اللومز من الانجلترا لورا اوفيامنت البروسيدور كلها حيكونوا باللغه الانجليزيه وديك اللي يراجوني الفين مش نتكلموا بالمالتي اوفيامنت اش دينجا البرلمان مالتي واللغه الثانيه اللغه المالتيه ريكرياسياكو روب بيننس بيننس جاتش جوزف سميت مكين اونرب ممبرز اوف بارلمنت استيم جيست ات از ماي اونر اند بريفليج to address you today on a subject that is close to the heart of our democratic principles, the role and evolution <coughs> of the parliamentary ombudsman. As we reflect on the journey of this vital institution, both in Malta and internationally, we gain insights from our past, understand our present, and look optimistically towards the future. The concept of the ombudsman originating in Sweden way back in 1809, was both a visionary and a revolutionary idea. It represented the embodiment of fairness and justice, ensuring the voices of the people that were ahead in the corridors of power. Over the years, this role has evolved, adapting to the unique needs of different societies. We have seen the Ombudsman transition from a mere supervisory figure to a pivotal element in upholding democratic values and human rights. Now, with regards to my country, Malta, it embraced this concept and established its own office uh, of the Ombudsman way back in 1995. This was, of course, a pivotal moment in our history, signifying also our commitment to transparency accountability, and the rule of law. Historically, the Ombudsman faced challenges like limited powers and a lack of public awareness. Yet, they persisted, carving a path towards greater accountability and transparency in governance. From Sweden to South Africa, from Canada to New Zealand, by the way, this is the model that we followed, the Ombudsman evolved with time, gaining national recognition and acceptance, and adapting to the unique challenges and specific contexts of each nation. Invariably, it stood as a guardian of citizens' rights and an advocate for administrative justice. The path of the Ombudsman has not been, of course, without challenges. In Malta, our Ombudsman has navigated complex issues ranging from administrative inertia to the protection of the individual rights and is rapidly changing laws and societal norms. The delicate balance between respecting the autonomy of public administration and ensuring justice for the aggrieved citizens has been a continuous journey of learning and adaptation. To this effect, I have to say that both the Constitution of Malta and the Ombudsman Act were on various occasions amended in Parliament to empower more the Ombudsman. The Constitution was, with regards to the Office of the Ombudsman, the last that was amended was quite recently, three and a half years ago in 2020, and it included, and I quote, in the exercise of his function, the Ombudsman shall not be subject to direction or control of any other person or authority, provided further that if during or after an investigation, the Ombudsman is of the opinion that uh, there is evidence of any corrupt practice as defined in the Permanent Commission Against Corruption Act, the Ombudsman may refer his findings directly to the Attorney General." Unquote. Again, also under the Ombudsman Act, in the same year, he was appointed, not the same year, four, four years after uh, that the, the Ombudsman Act came into being, in 20, 2007, he was also empowered to appoint, appoint commissioners for the invest, administrative investigation. Just then, that four years ago, again, he was also legally empowered, and I quote in the Ombudsman Act, uh, if during or after an investigation, the Ombudsman is the of, the, of the opinion 
that there is evidence of any corrupt practice as defined in the Permanent Commission against corruption, this is a reproduction of what is stated in the Constitution, because we have a written Constitution, it is reflected also in the Bosman, Ombudsman Act. The main act was also amended to the effect that his annual report of performance of his function under this act states, and I, I quote, that the said report shall as soon as possible be discussed during a dedicated parliamentary sitting, unquote. So this is the occasion when in Parliament uh, would debate also the report of the Ombudsman. Globally, Ombudsmen have faced similar challenges. In many countries, issues like limited resources, political interference, and the increasingly complexity of governance have tested the resilience and independence of this institution. Yet, though these challenges, Ombudsmen emerge stronger, more versatile, and more essential. The resiliency did not come without a cost. As lessons were learned, some moments exposed vulnerabilities, weakness, at times discouragement. In our current landscape, the role of the Ombudsman remains as crucial as ever. They are not just mediators, but guardians of justice, often standing as the last line of defense against administrative injustice. Political pressures, expanding responsibility, and the ever-increasing complexity of public grievance add layers of difficulty. Yet, amidst intermittent difficulties, there are many success stories. Take, for instance, I will take your example, uh, Mr. Berens, of your commendable work in the United Kingdom, which has set benchmarks in impartiality and effectiveness. The ride was never easy. As uh, I'm sure you, you will, you will uh, make reference to that. But your achievements are beacons of inspiration, reminding us of the profound impact an ombudsman can have. Now looking to the future, we stand at the cusp of a digital area. Technology promises to reshape our work, offering new, teas, new tools for encouragement and efficiency. Alongside these opportunities, once again, there are several challenges, maintaining the privacy, ensuring accessibility, and adapting to a rapidly changing world. Ombudsmen, therefore, need to continue to adapt, innovate, and collaborate globally. No matter how much the world changes, fairness and justice remain constant. There's much to be optimistic about, and I remember vividly uh, saying, among other interventions in the committee that I chair, in the House Business Committee, in March 2020, for example, and I, I, refer, I quote, I remember that there was a debate about whether one could consider that when a recommendation of the Ombudsman is put on the table of the House, because I lay all the reports on the table of the House, there would be an agreement between the government and opposition to have an ad hoc session and discuss that report. It is a procedure that we can start, that's what I said. In this way, we improve transparency and even improve the procedure when a problem arises. The vast majority of the recommendations are implemented, and this is something that I can confirm due to the fact, unquote, et cetera, et cetera. So in Malta, our commitment to strengthening the Ombudsman Office continues we ought to embrace technological aids in increasing accessibility and efficiency, but also to continue to raise public awareness and education about the Ombudsman role. I believe that while public relations are essential, the key, the key to enhancing this office is by unequivocally safeguarding its autonomy and legitimacy. I am personally optimistic because I see a future where, at the international level, the Ombudsman institution is becoming increasingly interconnected. The sharing of best practices, collaborative learning, and development of the national and international standards are shaping a future where the Ombudsman role is not just national, but part of the global framework of justice and accountability. I could see this in the gathering of the Association of the Mediterranean Ombudsman 
held here in Malta a few weeks ago, uh, where the Ombudsman, Zamit McKeon, our Ombudsman, shows the team the right to good administration, mid aspiration or reality. I remember in my address, I had remarked that the Ombudsman had created a forum for conversation and dispassionate deliberation about a subject that frequently arouses intense emotions as well as touching the lives of every person resident in these islands. I strongly believe that we need to keep fostering uh, such opportunities to think, criticize, discuss, question, share experiences, and above all, as it is our scope today, reflect. In conclusion, the journey of the parliamentary ombudsman from his historical roots to the present role and this aspiration for the future is a testament of our unwavering commitment to democracy and justice. As we reflect on this journey, let us renew our dedication to these ideals, both in Malta as part of the international community, but together we can ensure that the voice of the ombudsman remains strong, effective, and resolute in the pursuit of fairness and justice for all. So I take the opportunity to thank the Parliamentary Ombudsman of Malta, Judge Emeritus Joseph Zamit Mackeyan, and you, Mr. Rob Berns, for his insights as Health Services Ombudsman of the United Kingdom. I'm sure this will be a fruitful morning together from which we will definitely all benefit. This lecture that you are going to give us should serve not only as a platform for sharing knowledge, but as an opportunity for the creation of a new understanding and the forging of collaborative paths forward. We can perhaps discern our diverse perspectives when brought together that can shed light on ways that a single viewpoint cannot. I'm sure this lecture that you are going to deliver will add a unique piece of our collective understanding. We are here to listen, we are here to learn, we are here to contribute the, to conversations that will shape the future of our fields. Thank you very much, and I now give the floor to Judge Emeritus Zamit Nakian, the Parliamentary Ombudsman of Malta, to deliver his address. Honourable Mr. Speaker, Honourable Members of Parliament, dear Rob, Commissioners, distinguished guests. A civilised society is one which believes, lives and respects day in and day out, on all counts, without reserve, the rights of all. A society that is not democratic is not civilized at all. Democracy controls the exercise of power because when power is exercised without limits, the persons who are the recipients of rights, especially the vulnerable, are trust by the wayside. In a democratic and therefore a civilized society, the organs of the state manage power through a system of checks and balances. However, the expression of the modern state is not represented simply by the executive, legislative, and judicial organs, but also extends to the media, to civil society, and constitutional bodies like the Office of the Ombudsman. Because it is independent of all other state offices, the Office of the Ombudsman adds vigor and flavor to democracy. When the office investigates allegations of acts or omissions of government for maladministration, malpractice, unfairness, and improper discrimination, and makes recommendations, the Ombudsman keeps the administration under check, first and foremost to balance any act or omission unjustly perpetrated by the administration 
but also, and by no means less important, to enable the administration to change what requires change, to make its people and standards more accountable, to adjust whatever requires adjustment, to avoid wrong decisions, and place justice as its prime mover. When the public service listens and acts, it possibly is positively affects the welfare of persons, especially those who require understanding, care, and attention many a time because they are without a voice. The Ombudsman is there to act as this person's microphone, or to whom to whisper, or to refer if they are afraid, or hesitant to claim or affirm their rights. The office ensures that laws are being followed on substance and on merit. It is a vital indicator of a well-functioning democracy and an essential institution that lives day by day the rule of law. It is my convinced view that the office should also be a protector of human rights. So far, the office, as the law stands at present, does not have that specific role, emphasis specific. I am of the view that this should not remain the case. And it is a matter of public knowledge that I'm striving very hard for this state of affairs to change as soon as possible. The Ombudsman should be seen as an additional non-competitive accountability layer that checks to see if the public administration is working to the benefit of the public. In the course of his investigations, the Ombudsman can spot flaws and injustices by highlighting them and making recommendations as to how they should be fixed, the office would be tangibly represent an improvement in the quality of the democratic life of the state. What makes the office indispensably strong is the fact that the office is independent and separate from the other organs of the state. However, independence must be earned day by day through fearless action and determination. Crucial is the value of trust in the institution. People will vouch for the institution when the latter, through example, shows that it will not succumb to any sort of pressure from the public administration. A respectful, non-confrontational relationship with the public administration does not in any manner whatsoever affect trust. However, hidden agenda would be its detonator and a certain disaster. Trust is not a game of chance. It has to be a daily challenge and works both ways in the sense that, that not only must complaints trust the office, the complainants trust the office, but also must the public administration place trust in the office. I quote from a keynote speech which Mrs. Emily O'Reilly, EU Ombudsman, delivered in Brussels on the 18th November of 2015. A well-functioning ombudsman should let people know that they should expect from what they should expect from a democratic state. People should know that they have the right to an open and fair public administration, to know how policy decisions are made and why. They have the right to know who is seeking to influence decision making, and they have a right to redress. A public administration that is not built on these principles is not a good public administration. But while an ombudsman might have a very strong sense of what it means to be fair, what it means to be open, what it means to be truly accountable, it can be a very difficult job to make sure that administration shares this understanding. The translation of these fine words into actual administrative acts does not run smoothly yet. It is precisely the task of the Ombudsman to help to develop that shared consciousness and to enable an administration to do things, not because it is told to do so by the courts or by the Ombudsman, but because it is instinctively and unhesitatingly knows that it is the right thing to do. Making a public administration accept to implement individual recommendations is generally the order of the day. But culture change should be the priority. Transparency, 
ethical behavior, openness, and accountability should be part and parcel of the modus operandi of the public administration, not the exception. The office of the Ombudsman, even when its outlook is positive, can never say that his job is ready. Democracy is fragile, and administrative backdrop is constantly changing, more so in this country, where the mechanics of government has undergone massive and radical changes, like the creation of numerous authorities, agencies, foundations, and limited liability companies, where government is the majority shareholding, shareholder or where it holds a controlling interest. These are all challenges that the office must live up to. I conclude by quoting again from Mrs. Emily O'Reilly. Ombudsmen have great powers potentially at their disposal. The power of their own personality, the power of quality of the staff in the institution, the power of their investigative tools, the power of the moral authority of the role itself, the power of their alliances with parliament and with civil society, the power of public opinion and the power of the media. Successful ombudsmen are like the conductor of an orchestra. They know what instruments to play and when to play them. They know when to roll the drums and, or just the soft little fuel. And occasionally they know when to pause and reflect. A good ombudsman is always asking questions. A good democracy allows him to do so without fear and without favor. As far as your truly is concerned, I stop here. Now, please allow me to introduce Mr. Rob Barron's CB, UK Parliamentary Ombudsman and English Health Service Ombudsman since 2017. He studied political science and government at the universities of Nottingham and Exeter. He lectured in public policy and administration at the Coventry Polytechnic. He was a visiting professor at the University College London, Institute for Education, and also chair of the European Network of Ombudsman in Higher Education. In 1992, he became director of the South African Development Unit. He was involved in the preparation of a post-apartheid public service for his work. Not only was he commended, but he was also thanked personally by President uh, Nelson Mandela. In 1997, he became the director of the International Public Service Group, which provided valuable assistance to 25 countries in transition, including countries that were applying for membership to the European Union. In 2003, he was appointed secretary to the Committee on Standards in Public Life, a role that included providing advice to the Prime Minister on issues regarding ethics and conduct of public office holders. In, 19, in 2006, he became Complaints Commissioner of the Bar Standards Board, which regulates the behaviors and sets standards for barristers in England and Wales. In 2008, he became the independent adjudicator and chief executive of the Office of the Independent Adjudicator for Higher Education. In 2016, he was appointed commander of the Order of the British Empire for services rendered to higher education. Mr. Barnes has been an outstanding ombudsman and his qualities and values are, knowledgeable, are knowledged, acknowledged worldwide. Above all, and without any shade of doubt, he is indeed a gentleman with a heart for all. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Judge Amerdozan McKean. Now I give the floor to Rob Behrens, who is the Parliamentary and Health Service Ombudsman in the Kingdom. It's a privilege for us to have you here in Parliament and to deliver your presentation. You got the floor. Thank you very much. It's a great honour and joy to be with you today here in the uh, Maltese Parliament. I'm grateful to you, Mr. Speaker, uh, to Ombudsman uh, Zamet McCowan, uh, and to everybody here for their kind invitation and for coming. Through the Public Service Ombudsman Group and the International Ombudsman Institute, my office has had long-standing and cordial relations with the Office of the Maltese Ombudsman. 
And it's great that this is continuing with this kind of exchange. These uh, relations are important because being a national ombudsman is a lonely and difficult job. Um, when I took up post seven years ago, I was under no illusion how difficult it would be to lead an institution seriously in need of public and stakeholder trust. At my pre-appointment hearing in Parliament, a seasoned Labour MP said to me, frankly, Mr. Behrens, I've had a look at your career and you have a half-decent CV. Why would you want to spoil it by taking on this job? And my reply was, my wife has been asking the same questions. And he replied, sensible woman. And I said at the time, reminding me of what Emily O'Reilly said, that being an ombudsman would be like playing the piano and moving it downstairs at the same time. And so it has proved an immense challenge. In surviving what has been a character-building experience, I've relied on the core ombudsman principles of independence, fairness, and transparency, but also on the support of my work colleagues. You cannot be an ombudsman without taking your colleagues with you, as I noted uh, in the excellent atmosphere in the office yesterday, but also on my fellow international ombudsman colleagues. We talk to each other, we work with each other, we address very difficult situations and paradoxes. My office was created in 1967, and it's now the largest public service ombudsman scheme in Europe. I am the 10th ombudsman, and we have close to 600 staff based in Manchester and London. We have the powers of the High Court to call for papers in disputes and legal powers to require bodies in jurisdiction to cooperate with us. We use maladministration as a test of detriment for service users, a term including not only bias, neglect, and delay, but also poor service and now clinical failure and avoidable death in health cases. A detriment can be maladministration without being illegal. And that's something which is not always known uh, in government departments who believe that if they're abiding by the law, then they're not uh, exhibiting maladministration. I disagree with nothing that my distinguished colleagues ha have said. My office, like yours, is independent of government. The Ombudsman in the United Kingdom is a crown appointment, not a ministerial appointment. Appointed by Parliament under the Nolan Rules of Fair and Open Competition and confirmed by a vote of the House of Commons. I have to give an annual account to the Select Committee on the Constitution and Public Administration called PACAC. I have to do it both in writing and in person. And this account is far from formal. It is based on written evidence and up to three hours of intense questioning by a committee happy to probe and challenge the demeanor of an organization which in the last few years has had to survive uh, the emergency measures associated with COVID. Uh, and after that, with an emphatic rise in complaints by citizens as a result of the COVID situation and more besides. Um, so the relationship is a difficult but key one. And while we have our disagreements with the select committee, they have been crucial supporters of the Ombudsman in arguing for legislative reform to address the lack of powers which my institution, like yours, faces in trying to deal uh, with the modern world. This is very, very important. Um, the credibility of the Ombudsman depends on the ability of the Ombudsman to act. And in the UK, as in most countries, I have no clear power to 
make binding decisions. So I can make recommendations, but I can't enforce them. And frankly, I wouldn't wish it any other way. In South Africa, our counterpart uh, institution, the public protector, has binding powers, but these have led to bitter legal challenges and then an impeachment proceeding at huge expense and discomfort to the taxpayer. So without binding powers, we need to use the authority of our offices, the merits of the case, the power of uh, authority, and the fear, frankly, that a body in jurisdiction has of being summoned by the select committee to give an account of their non-compliance with our published decision. That is a process in the United Kingdom and it is, it is very important. In the last year, the threat of a select committee appearance for non-compliance has encouraged two very significant government departments after a long battle to pay compensation to individuals of up to £300,000 in two unrelated cases. Even without non-compliance, we use the prestige and focus of Parliament to raise the profile of our cases by laying reports before it. Most notably, the Select Committee used our report on tragic deaths associated with eating disorders in UK hospitals uh, to kickstart a significant five-year programme of reform undertaken by the Department of Health. When we published a big report on human rights and, and mental health in the National Health Service, an MP used our report straight away to raise the issues of mental health at Prime Minister's question time. <coughs> and our recent investigations have promoted parliamentary debates on welfare benefits for disabled people and the failure of the UK Foreign Office to address the torture of a British citizen in the United Arab Emirates. We do this with Parliament, not against Parliament. But frankly, we cannot just rely on Parliament for our activities. We have to act outside of it, and I want to come on to mention that. I'm also the subject of judicial review of my decisions, even though maladministration is not defined in the legislation. In a landmark High Court Judicial Review application made when I was Higher Education Ombudsman, the courts struck down an application by a student with sleeping disorders uh, for her appeal against my decision that she should not get the uh, compensation she required. And the court said, in a significant way, the judicialization of the Ombudsman so that it has to perform the same fact-finding functions and to make the same decisions on liability as the ordinary courts and tribunals would not be in the interests of complainants. Where there is a broadly non-legal and non-adversarial approach to resolving issues, that's where students and citizens should go. But the courts do intervene very occasionally. <laughs> In 2018, uh, they criticised the Ombudsman Standard, which I use to get clinical advice on cases and which causes clinicians to abide by that standard in giving me advice. And they said it wasn't clear enough. And in the last year, uh, my office has been criticised by the courts for the way in which it's handled the very big issue of the raising of the age in which women can withdraw their state pensions. That is valuable advice and we take it seriously. So last year, we received around 130,000 inquiries, including 41,000 telephone calls, and in the end, 35,000 complaints. We have an intake team of 40 people whose sole job is to deal with the reception of these inquiries. We now have a policy of seeking to resolve cases as early as possible and to only investigate where absolutely necessary. 
Many complaints are outside our jurisdiction. Some can be settled with quick telephone calls. Around 500 a year are settled in that way. And now, happily, we have a fully trained mediation team who are offering mediation between parties, bringing them together and allowing them to resolve the issue without an investigation. This is a significant way forward, uh, given that in much of the ombudsman world, there is a divide between those ombudsmen who investigate and those who mediate. We want to do both, and we think there's a good cause to do so. We end up with preliminary or in-depth decisions in around 8,000 cases, and we find maladministration in around one in eight of those cases. Each year, we are allowed to recommend financial compensation paid by the body in jurisdiction of around half a million pounds a year, following about 1,000 recommendations for improvement to bodies in jurisdiction. We also have to deal with an imbalance of the types of complaint we receive. I have two jobs as both health service ombudsman and parliamentary ombudsman. I have two jobs, but I, I, I need to say only one salary. The two uh, offices were brought together in 1973. And health service complaints considerably outweigh complaints against government departments. Why is this? There is a simple structural reason for it. Since 1967, complaints in cases about government departments cannot be made directly to my office, but must go to a member of parliament first. This is a hopelessly out of date and damaging rule. It's contrary to the Venice principles endorsed by the Council of Europe and the United Nations General Assembly. It has been consistently criticised by our Parliamentary Select Committee because it acts as a disincentive to citizens to bring their complaints forward. In a survey we recently completed of 2,000 people who had not gone to their MP first, 80% of them disappeared after being told that they would have to go to their MP. Now looking to the future, I have some abiding convictions which I want to put to you for a discussion. First, if an ombudsman is not independent and doesn't speak truth unto power, she or he is not doing their job. That's the top and bottom of it. As ombudsman, I've found for complainants over a succession of horrible avoidable deaths in the National Health Service. I've criticized the culture in the health service, which in too many situations enables leadership to put the reputation of their institution above patient safety. I've found that British citizens from the West Indies were subject to human rights violations in attempts to remove them from the United Kingdom after 50 years of peaceful contribution to British life. Time and again, British departments have failed to listen to their service users uh, and we have tried to put that right. That is our role. Secondly, one of the biggest obstacles to doing the job properly is wanting to be popular and to be loved by everyone. Well, I can tell you personally that this cannot happen. This is a misguided and impossible dream for an ombudsman who should never look to it. Thirdly, despite outstanding examples of heroic practice around the world, Dmitro Lubinets in Ukraine, Tudi Madonsela in South Africa, and Adam Bodnar in Poland, there is no golden age of the Ombudsman Institution to look back to. This is in part because there are lots of different types of Ombudsman Institutions. In much of North America, for example, Ombuds do not investigate at all. They confine themselves to support, advice, and mediation. Also, ombudsman institutions have had to continually reinvent themselves, as the speaker has pointed out, in the light of considerably changing circumstances. 
The loss of public trust in state institutions is a very big issue across Europe and the world. The decline of citizen deference in the face of state institutions. I had an hour and a half meeting uh, with a complainant and at the end of it, he got up and he said, Mr. Behrens, before I met you, I thought you were a complete idiot. Now, he said, I'm not quite sure about that. <laughs> Deference has gone, and that's probably a good thing. The slow erosion of gender bias uh, in uh, public sector hierarchies is very important and has led to people wanting to change the name of the ombudsman because they think it's a gender biased term. And the rise to commitment uh, to human rights approaches in public policy is very important, particularly for the new set of ombuds schemes which were created in the early 21st century. As a result, and in my view, ombudsman leaders and their parliamentary oversight bodies have to be collective and outward facing in their approach to big challenges. We have to learn from our own experience, but we also have to learn from the experience of our counterparts. As Benjamin Disraeli, who spent time on his grand tour in Malta, I've researched it, uh, he said about Sir Robert Peel, he was a burglar of other men's intellects. That's what ombudsmen have to do in order to be effective. It's a good thing. We and Parliament have to learn, borrow, and even steal ideas about what works as we go along. Fourthly, and most important, being an, an ombudsman is an art, it is not a science. I made this clear in the big research study we did with the IOI, uh, looking at the impact of COVID on European institutions, published in 2021, called The Art of the Ombudsman. Sorry, sorry about that. It was based on questionnaires returned from 57 national ombudsman schemes uh, and subnational schemes in 38 different countries. It's well worth reading, and there is a magnificent contribution from Malta in there. Being an ombudsman is an art because of the significant number of ambiguities or paradoxes we have to face on a daily basis. First, as already mentioned, the ombudsman has authority, but very little coercive power. This means that stakeholder relations, especially with parliament and bodies in jurisdiction, are vital. Now, we have addressed this in our jurisdiction with the co-production of what are called nationwide complaint standards. They are best practice guides and professional training, which we run for frontline bodies so that their complaints handlers have the skills they need to resolve complaints before they even come to the Ombudsman office. This has been widely welcomed across government and the health service, and it constitutes a non-adversarial, non-legally binding approach to improvement, and I think it's well worth looking at. Secondly, of course the Ombudsman must be impartial, but she or he also needs to be empathetic and to recognize the huge imbalance of power between very well-resourced public bodies and the individuals who complain to them. On a regular basis, people come to my office in a state of bereavement or trauma as a result of losing a loved one, often a baby, in the health service or beyond. Dealing with this requires specific skills development, not only on the wide ombudsman mandate, but also on the essential skills of communicating effectively, dealing with trauma, demonstrating empathy, and learning to be even-handed between parties in a dispute. This is not something you just pick up. It's something that needs professional development. And for me, the core of the challenge for the Ombudsman Institution is that at the moment, it is a quasi-profession, not a profession in itself. And we can perhaps talk about that, but that needs to be addressed. So in my period of office, we've done a lot of things to raise professional development. 
a comprehensive revised program of training and development for our staff. We've introduced an accreditation scheme for senior case handlers so that when they leave the office, they take with them qualifications which demonstrate what skills they have. We have set up a new Ombudsman Learning Academy where new colleagues spend 10 months in learning and practicing their roles before they become complaints handlers. It now has more than 100 graduates and it's changed the culture of our service, <coughs> allowing young graduates to come in and to learn how to be an Ombudsman without just picking it up as they go along. And last, and following this lead, we launched in Manchester three weeks ago with Maltese uh, uh, participation and support, uh, a new International Ombudsman Learning Academy uh, with a mediation skills program for case handlers in six counterpart countries. Uh, and this was a magnificent experience for all of us. And the Maltese support and presence at this event was greatly appreciated. Third of four points before I finish, and according to all respondents <laughs> to our surveys, the Ombudsman has to engage in the political process, but to have no involvement in party politics. This is absolutely fundamental, but very difficult to achieve. It's a golden rule, which has been broken in the last two years in the Russian Federation and in South Africa. We can talk about those instances, but they're very serious because they have damaging consequences for citizens, for the reputation of our institutions, and for what Joseph has just referred to, the key issue of public trust. One of the reasons I introduced Ombudsman peer review into the international community is so that Ombudsman colleagues can get feedback and advice on all the issues and ambiguities, particularly this issue, we face in the post-COVID world. Peer review is not a substitute for accountability by Parliament, but it does provide an additional dimension. And after the first peer review of my office in 2018, where Ombudsmen from around the world came to look at our institution, the peer reviewers were invited to give evidence before Parliament about what they had found. And that showed how well the two schemes can work together. My fourth and last point is that the National Ombudsman in large countries is very often the final resort for citizens who've exper experienced service failure from government departments but also the citizens know comparatively little about this institution. <clears throat> uh, walking around Valletta with your esteemed ombudsman yesterday, I know this is not a problem for you. Everybody we met seemed to know you, sir, and that's a very uh, important point. But in bigger countries, it is a key issue. Um, I went to a hospital in Sussex uh, at eight o'clock in the morning to visit, to find out what was going on, and a guy in pajamas and a dressing gown came up to me and he said, are you a lawyer? And I said, no, why, why would you think I'm a lawyer? And he said, uh, well, no one comes to this hospital at eight o'clock in the morning dressed in a suit and tie unless they're a lawyer. So I said, no. So he said, well, what are you then? So I said, well, as a matter of fact, I'm the National Health Service Ombudsman. I take the expletives out but he said, what the bloody hell is that? <laughs> and that shows to me the key issue for the Ombudsman, and we have to address that issue. And during my period, I've done five things to address this challenge. First of all, I've introduced annual open meetings to allow citizens to come and stakeholders to question me and my colleagues about our annual report. Secondly, you may have heard it, I've launched Radio Ombudsman on our website, a podcast of more than 30 editions over the last few years in which I've interviewed former complainants and stakeholders about what the real world is really like. And that's been so important in bringing people back 
and asking them to tell us why they think we didn't do very well or how, we, they, how they think we could do things better. Thirdly, the publication on the internet on a weekly basis now of summaries of case studies which we have resolved and now put into the public domain. We have to respect the privacy of investigation, but we should also realize that to demystify the process, we have to put it into the public domain in terms of what happened and how we did it. Fourthly, the extensive use of national media, including television and radio and newspapers, so that people understand what we're doing and what we're trying to do. And finally, now, the creation of regular ombudsman roadshows around the United Kingdom to meet people who would never dream of trying to get help because they don't know what to look for. So far, I've been with a small team to Northern Ireland, to Stockton and Darlington in the Northeast, to Bristol in the Southwest, and in February, we're going to Blackpool. And what we do is we try to meet people in vulnerable situations, not to say, do you want to make a complaint, but to listen to them so that we're sensitized to the issues and they get a sense of our concern and what we might do for them. I borrowed this idea from my Dutch counterpart and I'm pleased to have done so. We have to borrow from each other. We cannot be content only to serve those who seek us out. We must look for people in vulnerable situations and try to facilitate their empowerment. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Burns, for that enlightening and thought-provoking uh, lecture. Uh, definitely your insights in the past, present, and future of the parliamentary ombudsman role uh, is of great significance. And now we have to move forward. Uh, it is my privilege to introduce the next phase of this program. Uh, so I move into the question and answer session, and uh, I will invite now uh, Judge Emeritus uh, Zamit McCain, the Ombudsman in Malta, to moderate this part. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I don't wish this part of the program to be a monologue, please. We have very competent people around us. We have people from university. Two particular faculties are present here with their students. We have permanent secretaries of top quality with us. We have heads of department. So you must have questions to put to such an eminent speaker with such vast experience, both in the UK and abroad. Please, if there is anyone who wishes to put a question, I ask him to identify himself for the benefit of all and for who is um, following us from home in order to put his question concisely, clearly, as much as possible. Thank you. Auditor General, Mr. Charles Zaguara, your question. Thank you so much for your thank you so much for your inspiring speech. I think the passion with which you do your work is evident for, for all to see. So thank you so very much. Thank you to the Ombudsman and to the Honourable Speaker for making this happen. So I have served as Auditor General for eight years now and within the office for sixteen years. And you made reference to a very important point, I think, the fact that the Ombudsman has no executive power. Even in my case, I do not have any executive power. I don't think that I should have, to be honest. But we do try to estimate how many of our recommendations are being taken on board, because that shows at the end of the day, how effective our office is. So every two years, we issue two follow-up audit assignments to estimate and 
data indicates that about 80-85% of our recommendations are being taken on board. I have to say that some years back, the Office of the Principal Permanent Secretary even issued its own governance report that practically estimates the same thing. Now the question is this. I have, I have, and I have to emphasize, my view is that both the Ombudsman as well as the Auditor General, in a way, should act as a medical practitioner. So we examine the patient, we see whether there is any weakness, any sickness, and we prescribe the medicine. Now it's up to the patient to take the medicine or not. Obviously, if the patient doesn't take the medicine, medicine, it is the entity that suffers, not the doctor. So I am asked many times by the media, by other stakeholders, but why do, do you not insist that you have executive powers? Because in that way, your office may be more effective. Can you please go into this issue? Because although I personally think that we should not have executive power, I have to admit with you that sometimes I am not so sure when asked with this question. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much for that. And I want to be frank with you that occasionally I do wonder uh, the same thing. Um, this is not a competition, but uh, about 97% of our uh, compliance recommendations are accepted by bodies in jurisdiction. Sometimes graciously, uh, sometimes having to be dragged to uh, compliance by the threat of publicity and so on, but mostly it happens. The problem is when it's a very big case uh, and the government uh, decides that it doesn't want uh, to implement the recommendation. What do you do then? And as things stand, all we have is the power of publicity. And unless a parliamentary select committee is prepared to come up and uh, cross-examine the department, then not a lot is going to happen. Uh, unless there is a media campaign. I don't know whether you've seen uh, in the UK, there's a case of a post office where uh, actually, um, uh, post office uh, managers have been accused of um, uh, fraud and many went to prison or were uh, convicted in the courts. And it's only very recently that uh, it's been recognized to be inappropriate and incorrect. And it's actually the power of a television program which has forced the government to engage uh, in more rapid uh, approach to compensation. But I bring you the case of South Africa where the public protector uh, has binding powers and what that has done uh, has meant that there has been a legalization of the ombudsman process in which when she has made recommendations uh, and instructions on bodies to institute recommendations which she has proposed, bodies in jurisdiction have gone to the courts and raised uh, concerns and complaints and that's led to millions of rand being spent on litigation which is not really to the benefit of anybody and unfortunately the public protector in south africa was impeached by parliament uh, because uh, she didn't do the job properly and uh, she reflected bias uh, in the way in which she uh, used her binding powers but um, the, the test is what it does to the public, and the public have been 
outraged by the use of public money uh, by an institution uh, which should be representing them and ended up defending the public protector um, in a way which was not very dignified. So what I'm saying is there's no easy solution to this. It would be better if there was authority and consensus. Sometimes that's not going to happen and then you have to decide what to do. But I, like you, would be very, very cautious about making uh, my office um, having uh, the power to tell people what to do. I, next question, I have behind me Dr. Mario Thomas Vassallo, who is Dean of the Faculty of Public Policy and Politics at the University of Malta. I give the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you, Malta Ombudsman. Thank you, Ukraine. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you for uh, this morning. I have prepared my presentation so as not to take long. I don't have a question. I have an appeal. Thank you for this inspiring and thought-provoking event this morning. And as head of Department of Public Policy at the University of Malta, I could relate to all the ideas and concepts that you have expressed this morning because they are the same concerns and challenges that we discuss with our students every single day on campus. In a state where kollox politka, in a state where everything is politics, and partisan politics often leads public discourse in the village square and on social media, as a citizen, as an academic, I cannot make peace with the lack of appropriate political education we have in Malta. We have been among the first from this house to give the right to 16-year-olds to vote. And we have been the first and the unique, and hopefully the only, to assign the role of mayor to a 16, 17-year-old. However, we have remained in total darkness in terms of political literacy, policy design, and public management acumen. My department, the Department of Public Policy, has already prepared a research proposition to introduce politics and governance as a new intermediate post-secondary subject, not excluding secondary school. Up to now, the only political education is one TV owned by Malta Labour Party, by Party Laborista, and net television and radio owned by Party Nationalista. So you can imagine uh, this country, half a million people, where political education is simply non-existent and only uh, dependent on party media, political party media. We cannot sustain democracy without political education. The work of the ombudsman could become even more cumbersome, more than it is, and problematic, unless we truly commit ourselves to invest in political literacy and the nurturing of good governance. My, my, my appeal, given the privilege of a parliamentary seat just for two hours, <laughs> may I take this opportunity to, ta to once again appeal to politicians and decision makers to unite behind this urgent call more than ever to introduce a systematic and wide-ranging approach to ascertain political education among the younger Maltese generation in the hope that the ombudsman of tomorrow would have a slightly less stressful job than today. Long live integrity. Thank you very much. I agree with everything that you've said. 
Um, what I want to say is I was brought up um, in the thrall of uh, Michael Oakeshott, who wrote a book called Rationalism in Politics. In 1962, he was at the London School of Economics, and he wrote a chapter called Political Education, in which he said that the point of a conversation is that there's no point. It's to understand each other's arguments so that we can better appreciate them. And we need that uh, more and more as the world becomes more complex. So I agree with you. Uh, I have done quite a lot to um, encourage uh, schools to come to my office, to uh, spend time with me and my staff, uh, to give them internships, at the age of, say, 15, so that they get an appreciation of what an ombudsman is. I, be, I went to one inner city school, which was 97% ethnic minority uh, populated. And I met the parents. And none of the parents knew what an ombudsman was. And they all wanted their children to be either lawyers or accountants or doctors. And they had no concept of what an ombudsman was. And then when the boys came to my office and spent the day with me, they got rid of their teacher. They were 15-year-olds. They sat around the table with me. They got rid of their teacher. And they said, we want to talk to you about some issues. And I thought, well, we're going to talk about integrity, independence. No. How much do you earn, Rob? That was the question. Is it six figures? You know, um, that is the kind of culture which we're having to deal with. And if universities and schools and ministries of education don't get hold of this, then we're going to be in very serious trouble. So I agree with you absolutely, and I commend your university for doing the things it's doing to promote uh, the concept. Thank you very much, Rob. Thank you very much, Dean. Another dean of another, um, of another uh, faculty of our university, Dr. Ivan Mifsud, dean of the faculty of laws of our university. Ivan. Speak. Okay, speak. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Mr. Behrens, I followed your speech with a lot of interest. I can tell you that I started my career with the parliamentary ombudsman. I was very young, I was an investigating officer. And uh, even though I moved into academia, until, in fact, when I moved into academia, I took ombudsman with me and ombudsman studies, etc. And now I'm at the other end because the ombudsman investigates us as well, which is a very good thing as well. And I have a lot of questions for you, but I'm going to restrict myself to one particular question. One thing which struck me and which even Judge Zamit McKeon, our Maltese Ombudsman, mentioned. The lack of powers of the Ombudsman. Now, at the same time, you said that you wouldn't like to be like South Africa with executive powers. So I'm presuming you're not referring to the fact that you don't have executive powers. So when you mention lack of powers, what are you referring to, please? Thank you very much. It's very ni nice to meet uh, <clears throat> um, a gamekeeper to, who's to become a poacher. And, uh, <laughs> long, I'm sure you better understand the issues uh, now. And thank you for your question. There are significant things that I need that I have are not uh, my legislation is not in compliance with the Venice principles about. And I have campaigned for that uh, in the last seven years. We nearly got the legislation in 2016, but there was something called the referendum on uh, EU membership. There was then Brexit, then, then COVID, uh, and it, it didn't happen. First of all, we need, you've got own initiative powers so that people who can't complain 
can have cases investigated without them having to come to us. And if I'd had those powers, uh, I could have saved lives and saved huge uh, unhappiness across the country. And what I found from this survey was that countries that had an ombudsman with own initiative powers were able to investigate things that went wrong during COVID much more quickly than those that didn't. So I think that's the first thing. The second thing is to get rid of the MP filter, which is an outrage, okay? The third thing is, unlike you, we have no joined up um, omb national ombudsman scheme in the UK. So we have a series of public service ombudsmen who deal separately with higher education, policing, housing, local government, social care, and then we have my office which combines national government. Now how can we expect people to understand where to go to if there's so many competing schemes that they don't know where to go? And at least 50% of the time of my intake team is spent on telling people they've come to the wrong place and advising them where to go. Now, according to Bernard Jenkin, the MP, who is the chair of the select committee, that is a public service that we're performing. And I accept that. But I'd rather it was clearer with one joined up scheme. Um, um, and that would make it much simpler. The final thing, which is outrageous, is that two years ago, the government introduced what it called safe space in the National Health Service through legislation, which was an attempt, uh, an honorable attempt, to allow clinicians to disclose what had really happened in an incident without being held accountable for it and to do that without being engaged in an investigation. And what they said was that I would only be able to look at those cases with the approval of the High Court. Now, the Venice principles say absolutely that that is uh, a diminution of my power to look at public administration in general. I took my case to the Venice Commission, I argued it. They unanimously agreed that I was right, that the Ombudsman had been introduced in this way. And the government said, we understand the position, but we're not prepared to do anything about it. So in those cases, it would concretely help citizens if we could change the rules to make the mandate easier to be more impactful for the Ombudsman. But what I never want to do is to lie back and say, help me, you know, we don't have enough power. We have a lot of power in terms of our authority, our resources, things that most ombudsmen don't have. And we have a wonderful cadre of people who go to the very limits to do it. I think the last point I would make on this, we don't have human rights powers, but we deal with human rights cases on a daily basis. You know, the Windrush case is a good example of that. That's about uh, the violation of, uh, of people's fundamental rights. It didn't stop us looking at it. So hopefully that's a concrete answer to you. I pass the floor to um, Chief Justice Emeritus uh, Vincent De Gaetano, Commissioner for Education at the Office of the Malta Parliamentary Ombudsman. Judge De Gaetano. Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Ombudsman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Behrens, for that uh, Lectio Magistralis, if I can call it so. Um, I was struck by um, something you said in connection with judicial review in your country, where you said the, the courts came down against uh, um, the, some rules about women withdrawing state pensions or something to that effect. Now, that uh, struck a note because, uh, as we all know, most of us know, um, there is no fundamental human right to a pension as such. Uh, yet, um, there is now, uh, in the European context, a fundamental right not to be discriminated in the enjoyment of any right, 
not simply in the enjoyment of a fundamental right. Now, I know that your country, the United Kingdom, has not signed, proto not, neither signed nor ratified Protocol No. 12, but Malta signed and ratified Protocol No. 12 about uh, uh, more than almost eight years ago now. And yet it has not been transposed into the European Convention Act. We have transposed into the European Convention Act all the uh, protocols that Malta has signed and ratified. But as we all know, Protocol Number 12 uh, speaks about uh, uh, discrimination in the enjoyment of ordinary rights, not, uh, not uh, fundamental rights. I was wondering, how do issues of discrimination in the enjoyment of ordinary rights come to the attention of your office, uh, if at all. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that very good question and for your time yesterday. Appreciate it. So, just on the women's state pensions case first, uh, this is a very big case involving significant numbers of people and it's not yet concluded. So I can't talk in detail about that because we have to investigate in private. But what I will say about it is that we hope very soon to make a decision. The courts have already ruled in this case that the government did not act illegally in the way in which it behaved. So the issue for us has been whether or not there was maladministration of a non-legal kind as far as this was concerned. So it's more nuanced than whether or not people had a fundamental right in that sense. Um, I gave evidence to uh, a select committee last year, the Justice Select Committee, in which they asked me whether or not we should have a human rights ombudsman in the UK uh, because I don't have that formal power and my answer was very clear we've got more than enough ombudsman in the UK without creating another one what we need to do simply is to amend the powers of the national ombudsman to allow for uh, a consideration of those human rights but even if we don't we run training for our staff to identify the rights that may be impacted uh, in cases in a way uh, which enables a focus on human rights. And we learnt about that from the Northern Irish Ombudsman who used the same legislation really to take forward uh, human rights issues. And we managed to do that and to point out um, to people who may not see it as a human right. You know, in disability cases in hospital, for example, people don't necessarily talk about their human rights. They talk about the horrid experience they've been through uh, as a result of their uh, treatment uh, in mental health cases. So we have to draw that out. But the fundamental thing and the difference between us and a court is that we cannot say there has been an illegal act. We can only say we believe that there may be a case for believing that uh, an illegal act has taken place in this respect. So we can draw that to the attention of other people. We can't make a fundamental finding on it ourselves. Thank you. I pass the floor to Deputy Speaker, the Honourable, Doc the Honourable David Ajus. Thank you very much. It's an honor for me that in this house we have today such an important number of personalities. And allow me, Mr. Speaker, to ask two questions. Um, first one is, um, what do you think is the correct or the amount of time that should be taken by an ombudsman and an office of the ombudsman from the day that someone, that a normal citizen, files a complaint till the actual day when there's a conclusion. And my second one is, should Parliament, where we are today, debate those cases where there's a conclusion by the Office of the Ombudsman 
and there is no decision as yet or no feedback as yet or no execution by the government. Should Parliament um, uh, have time and allocated a dedicated Parliament sitting where these particular um, uh, instances are debated by the members of Parliament. Thank you. Thank you very much. Two good questions, two quick answers. How long is a piece of string? I mean, it depends on what the complaint is and how complicated it is rather than uh, specifying the amount of time that you spend on it. So we do our very best to try and ensure that we don't need an investigation um, right up front and we can resolve it in a way which we call early resolution. And in the vast majority of those 35,000 cases, we resolve it without, we resolve it quickly within a matter of days without it going to an investigation. If it is complex, and deaths in the health service are very complex, uh, because we need to commission uh, independent advice from clinicians in perhaps three or four different uh, specialisms. And we have to give people the right to see that and to comment on it. We produce draft recommendations for people to look at. It could take um, many months, and in some cases years, in order to do it effectively. And we do our very best to advise people how much time it's going to take given the complexity of the issues. And you need to do that by constantly communicating with people about what's going on, about how long the case is going to take. In the COVID situation, we've had a backlog uh, of cases. We had to close the office for four months because hospitals closed down their complaints department uh, and put people into uh, bereavement counseling and so we weren't able to continue looking at health cases for four months. That led to a backlog. And so uh, we had to explain to people that there will be a number of weeks, uh, sometimes months, uh, in the last two years before we could actually begin an investigation. And I think given uh, the national crisis, that is acceptable. But it's not acceptable if you delay, uh, if you allow... Uh, bodies in jurisdiction to take extra time uh, to try and push it into the long grass. You have to actively uh, seek to resolve cases and we set ourselves benchmarks about what an average case time would look like uh, which Parliament constantly uh, reminds us about uh, and looks at. So um, it's about constant dialogue with the complainants and not allowing the body in jurisdiction to uh, push it into the long grass. That was the first answer. Oh, yeah. Oh, but I think uh, Honourable Ajus is very eager on the second yeah, one. Th That's what at least the impression I got. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> so, I apologise. Um, look, I personally believe that Parliament has a crucial role to play in addressing non-compliance where the Ombudsman has no binding power. And if Parliament doesn't do that, it does a disservice to accountability in the country. It means that non-compliance can be got away with by departments and health services, and that's an incentive to hold out against complying. Uh, my parliament, through the select committee, does look at these issues. Uh, I would like them to look at it more. They don't always look at, complaint, uh, at cases we lay before parliament. But I think there is uh, an importance in parliament debating non-compliance so that people think very carefully before they don't, don't comply. What do you think? Um, I think together with Mr. Speaker, we had started to talk about this subject that in Parliament, yes, we need to have a session uh, that we will debate such matters, yes.
That's my personal opinion, and I think it should. I mentioned that in my speech uh, earlier. Thank you. No, okay. I have an, another question. This time from Miss Amy Malia from the British High Commission. Thank you for coming. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, so my question is directed at both of you. Um, you both spoke of the challenges of your job and somewhat um, of the limitations. Um, what would you say? Ms. Malia, please raise your voice. Sorry, I'm it's, a soft It won't be a problem, you know, just raise your voice, that's all. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm a soft-spoken person by nature. Um, what would you say are the biggest areas for improvement in your job? And do you feel you could be better supported by your respective states? You said? Improvement, yes. Through the initiatives of the ombudspersons, you mean, mm -hmm. uh, what this has brought about, brought about uh, in real terms as improvements. This is your question, no? Yes. So, um, uh, excuse me. And the second part was? And do you feel like you could be better supported by your, in your respective states? Uh, so, thank you very much. Are you asking what has improved or what should be improved? What should be improved? Yeah. <laughs> thank you. The big improvement is the way in which we handle data. And that is a key issue for ombudsmen around the world. The, the arrival of artificial intelligence creates huge opportunities to improve the speed and intelligence we have about trends and about what uh, people are thinking about. And we have just uh, appointed a new chief of uh, data uh, and technology to try and accelerate the huge amount of evidence that we get about what people are bringing to us and to try and address uh, those issues. And we haven't got near it yet. And that, you know, there's lots to learn. In Estonia, for example, they have it all online. They're leading uh, training in artificial intelligence and we're, we're well behind that. So I think that is a big area of improvement uh, which we need. The second thing is, if I'm frank, um, the Ombudsman of Austria has a public recognition rate of 70%, 70. My public recognition rate is 17%, 17%. Now, is that because I'm boring and she is not? I don't think so. I hope not. It's because of the structural position of the ombudsman in the UK being part of a whole bevy of ombudsman schemes where it's very difficult to sort out who's who. So we need to do that. Now, does the state support us? Is that, was that your second question? Um, sort of. It's more along the lines of how can they better support you? Okay, so I have regular meetings with ministers to address the issues of concern that I raise before them. And I always get a hearing uh, from both ministers and officials, which I'm grateful for. And rela relations are not bad on an interpersonal level. But where you have a situation of being promised ombudsman reform to improve the powers of the institution for 10 years, and where select committees have been saying for 20 years we need ombudsman reform and it doesn't happen, then to my mind that is hugely disappointing and something that I should not remain quiet about. So. We need to be more in line with the Venice Principles, which were signed up 
with the full support of the United Kingdom government. And they even supported the United Nations General Assembly recommendation to endorse them. That's good, that's excellent. We now need to see the legislation which uh, would implement that support. I believe, Amy, you want me to answer, I don't know? Yes, please. Yes, Thank yes. you. First reaction is this. Whether the country knows about the Ombudsman, I can assure you that the country knows about the Ombudsman. And at a very high rate. Now, that raises the profile. And that raises the expectations, all just the same. Now, how do we do this? By a day-to-day -day action. That is why I emphasized in my presentation the day-to-day -day approach. Not a nine-to-five approach. My office, just for your information, starts at half six in the morning. It is a seven-day operation, as far as I'm concerned, among other matters. Now, by doing so, you, perfect, you raise to perfection the outreach approach. And the outreach approach is very important. You instill faith in people, you instill the approach in people, and even in a simple radio program, you try to console people. And console not, ju not just for consolation's sake, but for active, being active about it. That's the first thing. Second thing, improvement, where would you like to see improvement? In these nine months that I have been in office, as far as my recipients on the public administration point of view, they are all here, a lot of them are here. I've seen a very proactive approach. I've said it, reset it, and will continue to say it. Does it mean that there isn't improvement that that should be there? Of course that should be. My appeal is for the permanent secretaries who are doing a, a splendid job in the, the various, in the various uh, departments and these uh, ministries they have, to uh, instill faith in their um, liaison officers who are also present today and give them the instruments to be uh, effective in the way they reply to the ombudsman the office is a, not a competitive body. It is there to help give voice to people. I will not, for the next five years, you will hear me repeating this, giving voice to people and resolving their problems. In, the ombudsman by himself, he can't do it. He needs the public administration. My appeal is for the public administration in its various facets, especially where you have the authorities, some um, CEOs from the authorities are also here, please open up your ears on this one. They have to uh, act in a way that they do not treat the ombudsman as if he wants to uh, cross them in some way or, or find a cross on their, on their no, no, it's not, not the way. We investigate, we try to resolve, we mediate, and if it's not possible to come to a solution, then we report, we find our report. Fourth thing you raised, is, uh, is my office being financially supported? Yes. I am, if the office uh, is, will, will increase its, its remit, which I hope one day it, it, it will come. I'm, I'm already said it. I'm fighting for the human rights issue to be part of the remit. Human rights, clearly, not indirectly, clearly a remit of the ombudsman. Then I, 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 I will appeal for more funds. But as the position is today, we are adequately in place. Answer everything? Uh, yes. 
Thank you. Very good. <laughs> Seeing the eyes of the law students uh, blinking from here, does that mean you want to put a question? Please, uh, introduce yourself. Um, thank you very much, Judge Zamit McKean, Mr. Speaker, thank you. Um, my question comes from my experience in, in pupillage at a, at a local law firm. Oftentimes, professionals are faced with giving advice to clients when they when they, um, uh, when they have a case of bad administration. And they are, they are stuck between two choices, either giving advice to go to the ombudsman or giving advice to go to court. And the issue is they have to choose. You cannot go to the ombudsman and then go to court. You cannot go to court and then go to the ombudsman. And the issue then becomes whether the, the lawyers cannot obviously give advice whether the recommendation by the, by the ombudsman will be taken up or not by, by the government. So they are sort of lean, they always lean towards going to court for a, a judicial review proceedings because they know that if they win there, the, the remedy will be, will be granted, whereas the ombudsman, it's always a, a game of chance. So, um, this is something that us as the Malta Law Student Society, we've pushed for um, some, some reforms on this point, um, which as of yet have not, been, have not been taken up, but we hope that um, through some more lobbying there might be some, some progress. But we're, we're, we're curious as to your, your opinion on this matter. I don't know if um, Judge Zamit McKeon also has um, some comments. Thank you. Uh, Rob, the, I will start on this one myself. Um, I see that you have seen the report of the Ombuds plan of the office. The office has already made it very clear that there is no competition between the courts and the office of the Ombudsman, but life can be made easier for people. And you make the life easier for people if you, during the period that the Ombudsman invest is investigating the, the, the complaint, the period of prescription should be suspended, not interrupted, suspended. And in that case, you give time. The, the courts will give, will most certainly tell you a very big thank you. All right? And, but as far as the citizens' rights are concerned, you have give, given them time to, for investigation. And after the investigation, if it doesn't, if, if it is not successful in any way for anybody, that prescriptive period will resume. In the UK, uh, if somebody goes to court, they cannot then come to the Ombudsman to ask for the Ombudsman to uh, come to a different view, and that's very, very important. Now, the advantage of coming to the Ombudsman is there's no charge. It's a free service, and you don't have to pay legal fees when you go to court, which in the UK are very substantial. There's no getting away from that. Secondly, uh, we can make recommendations about uh, not only resolving the detriment, but making recommendation to the body and jurisdiction to change its behavior and its policy. Courts tend not to do that. And so there is an advantage of flexibility which the Ombudsman has. The third thing is that uh, we are no slower than the courts. You know, in the UK, uh, the courts have huge backlogs uh, to deal with, so they're not, people are not going to get a quicker route. But it's a matter of advice which you are happily providing, and it will change from case to case depending on what the possibilities are. We say to people, this is my last point, if you want money specifically, don't come to us. You know, we, we, we have a scale of uh, uh, recommendations for how much money we ask people to pay. It's not huge in comparison to what the courts can offer. So if you want money, it's better to go to the courts than it is to come to us. Anything else? Another law student, please. So, thank you, Judge Zamit McKean. Um, thank you, um, uh, Mr. Robbins, for your insightful comments. I have 
two questions. So the first question is that um, I have noticed that in recent years, our government has composed several grievances boards or other boards um, which have the same sort of competence or function as the ombudsman. Does this worry, um, does this worry you that these um, institutions and boards such as grievances boards um, strip away from the jurisdiction of the ombudsman and subsequently parliaments function in scrutinizing um, government decisions? And the second question is this. So um, it is reported in Europe that Europe is facing a rule of law backsliding and uh, um, populism is, is ever increasing. What is the role of the ombudsman um, in this regard? Thank you. Thank you for the question. I just um, answer as it should be answered. By looking at the glass half full rather than half empty. The way they were conceived, the grievances boards, way back in 2013, or some, some more time after that, had a particular role. Hmm? Now, this, these boards today have changed their approach. At the office of the Prime Minister, there are three very competent people. They are here, the three of them. Until a few, um, some, some, just weeks ago, they were led by a permanent secretary. Today, they are led by a director general, or Estes here. They are doing a splendid job and cooperating with the ombudsman. You know how they cooperate with the ombudsman? At the most sensitive time, when the ombudsman gives his final report, and before the ombudsman uses his discretion in case that report is not implemented by the public authority itself, to intervene and ask what is happening. That is a role that started, that was, uh, was kick-started nine months ago, and it is working very well. And that is a positive approach. So the boards were constituted with a specific purpose when the relations between the office of the ombudsman and the public service weren't <laughs> idyllic. Let me put it this way. You ask me, are they idyllic now? We're not here to write poetry, we're here to act. And that is what we'll do. Everybody in his own role. That is my reply. Could I say two things, for, for two very good questions. On the second issue, it was about populism, did you say? Um, look, I, I'm not going to make a speech warning people uh, not to get involved in party politics if they're an ombudsman and then make a comment about populism. What I will say is that there are some brilliant examples uh, of how ombudsmen have resisted populist tendencies in Europe, which we could learn from. I'm thinking of the Polish example of Adam Bodnar, who resisted attacks from a populist government in the fields of LGBT plus rights, uh, the history of uh, Polish war enterprises and so on. And he stood firm against that, and I think that's, that's brilliant. And incidentally, he's now the Minister of Justice in Poland, so it, it, it comes around. But on your second point, in the UK, every time there is a crisis in the health service, and there have been many, the government tends to create a new agency to deal with that without getting rid of a former agency. So what we have in health in the UK is a hugely over-regulated uh, arena which makes coordination very difficult. And that's not a good idea. And I strongly support the principle of integrating uh, into one ombudsman and fewer regulators without reducing 
the spending on it so that we have a more joined up, coherent approach to regulation. So I think the government should practice what it preaches in that respect. Anyone else? Yes, Gordon. So I'm Gordon Fitz from the Office of the Ombudsman. I believe it was you, Mr. Barron, who said that we sh the Ombudsman should not be involved in party politics, but involved in the political process. Could you elaborate on that, please? Yes. Um, so I can only do that by giving you uh, a concrete uh, example. Um, in the case of Windrush, where citizens from the West Indies came uh, in the early 1960s and uh, were, were welcomed as British U United Kingdom citizens and took part in uh, social life and employment in the UK over 50 years, the government at the turn of the century turned around and said, we're going to create a hostile environment uh, for immigrants and we're going to get rid of those people who've come here illegally. And unfortunately, the Windrush generation got caught up in that and they uh, were told that they would have to leave the United Kingdom, which was the only country they belonged to and had known. And they were required to document their employment for the last 40 years and their citizens' rights, which they couldn't do because they hadn't expected that um, to happen. The Ombudsman's job in that situation is to defend the rights of those citizens whose rights had been abused. It's not the Ombudsman's job to comment on whether or not creating a hostile environment by a political party is an appropriate thing to do. That's a party political question. It's not for the Ombudsman. The consequences of what happened are for the Ombudsman. So I think there is a clear distinction there, and it's very important. And could I just make this point? Uh, I've been to Ukraine twice now, uh, which has been a, uh, an incredible experience for me to see what an Ombudsman is like in wartime and the challenges there. And the International Ombudsman Institute decided after four meetings and deep discussions to expel the Russian commissioner because she had no distance between herself and the Kremlin. Whatever the Kremlin did, uh, she defended. So she was not behaving as an ombudsman. She was behaving as an apparatchik of the Kremlin of President Putin. And to our mind, that brought into disrespect the Ombudsman Institution, and we took the very serious decision to expel the Russians from the IOI, the, one of the first bodies to do that. I think that was the right decision to make because we felt she had become too party political. I hope that that's clear enough. I, we are almost at the very end. I have a, a question uh, for you. Uh, it's rather a statement, but a question with it. This morning, I was viewing LinkedIn, like many of you do, and I saw um, a very sharp um, comment by the, your colleague, and I met him in Birmingham this year, last year, the housing ombudsman of the UK. And he, I'm, I'm going to read this out because it's so important, but I want you, you to comment about it, if, if, if whether you've seen it or not, this morning. A decent home is a basic human need, but fair and reasonable services which recognize the individual circumstances especially when vulnerability presents, can be a human right. 
What do you think of this? Okay, well, so Rick Blegway is a friend of mine. He's the chair of the Ombudsman Association in the United Kingdom, and he's a good colleague, okay? You're the lawyer, so you, you would be better able to comment on that than I do. What I think he's doing is justifying his interventions in the failure of public authorities to provide decent housing for people uh, who, who are entitled to it and pay for it, but they don't get the services that they need, and there have been deaths and illness as a result of that. And I think that's exactly right. Thank you, um, Mr. Speaker. I thank you, um, uh, Judge Emeritus, and, and you, of course, uh, Rob, uh, for this en enriching session, uh, which we are now coming to a close. But I would like to extend our deepest gratitude to you for traveling to Malta and sharing uh, your invaluable experiences at the UK's Parliamentary and Health Service Ombudsman. I'm sure that your insights today have enlightened us and inspired us with a deeper understanding uh, of this critical role of the Ombudsman, ombudsman uh, in today's society. Uh, I'm sure also you realize how the Maltese people participate very strongly. I mean, uh, just to give you uh, some figures, I mean, in every general election, more than 90% voluntarily of the people go and cast their vote. I mean, your highest percentage was in the 2019, 65% of, of the total population. But I, I'm, just not, I'm just passing this because as Professor Vassallo uh, mentioned, the, the importance of having also in the curriculum uh, the subject of the political uh, subject, but I'm sure that most of Maltese um, do, do follow a lot. And also with the cost to clearance rate. I mean, if we are to legislate, we have a very strong clearance rate in the parliament. I mean, the clearance rate of the legislative clearance rate in Malta is the highest now in Europe. I'm sure now you're looking behind in the UK because uh, I was reading your report, uh, which you presented in the um, Public Administration uh, Constitutional Affairs Committee, which I think was in October of last year. And you remarked correctly that notwithstanding that Parliament was uh, agreeing with the reforms, eight years after, they still did not legislate uh, what, about, but that is not our problem because when we decide, I can share, I can assure you, both government and opposition, we have quite a good. But anyway, I must express our sincere appreciation also to, to my, to the Maltese ombudsman, uh, for for of course the this important uh, lecture event uh, participation, uh, which this lecture reinforces the significance of our parliament. Uh, highlighting its role beyond the enactment of the laws which are, and the scrutiny of the executive. Definitely, but not last, I must also uh, remark about the uh, participation of all those who participated uh, in, this, in, this, uh, in this event. And uh, definitely we should continue together uh, to build on the foundation uh, of what I referred to in my earlier uh, introductory speech on transparency, accountability, and dialogue, which you uh, uh, mentioned quite a lot to continue on dialogue in, even after the investigation of, of the Ombudsman, the, which are the essential pillars of our democracy. Now I invite you all for the uh, family photo uh, until we, we come to a close to this event. Thank you very much. <laughs>